Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. Question number one, David Torrance. To ask the Scottish Government how Scotland's onshore revenues compares to the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Scotland's onshore revenue in 2015-16 is estimated to be £53.7 billion, £1.9 billion higher than in 2014-15. On a comparable basis, excluding revenue associated with English housing associations, this represents 8% of the UK total. David Jones. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Scotland's positive economic outlook is being unduly exposed to a threat as Brexit could see us withdrawn from the biggest single common market against our will? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do believe that that is a key risk to Scotland's economy in terms of leaving the EU. Um, Scotland exports £11.6 billion a year to the EU. That's 42% of total international exports and it is increasingly clear that the hard Brexit as is being described by some in relation to the UK government's approach has significant financial consequences for the UK and for Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Given that the Finance Secretary is a conscientious and diligent soul, I assume that he will have read his government's own GERS report from front to back. So can he therefore confirm it demonstrates that Scots benefit from £1,200 more public spending per head by being part of the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know that Kezia Dugdale will be well aware that Scotland also generates more per head generally than the rest of the United Kingdom and that Scotland, and that Scotland uh, has strong economic foundations in which we can grow our country to share the prosperity and wealth for all of our people in Scotland. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the union dividend actually amounts to £1,600 for every man, woman and child in Scotland. £1,200 in higher spending or £400 per head because our economy underperforms the rest of the UK. Why does the Cabinet Secretary want to deprive the Scottish people of this sum of money? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there we go again. The Tories want to talk about yeah. constitution. Absolutely. You're obsessed with it in terms of the Conservatives. We are... We are embarking on a bold programme through the programme for government and in due course the budget to grow our economy and build on the strong fundamentals of the Scottish economy and it is decades of Westminster rule that has left Scotland in the economic position that we've found ourselves in. Made worse, made worse by the threat, by the threat to remove the United Kingdom and Scotland from the European Union. Yeah. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In view of the record budget deficit numbers announced by the government last week of £15 billion, how does this reconcile with the First Minister's statement yesterday that the government will use the strength of its balance sheet to help Scottish business, bearing in mind that that budget deficit is the largest of any Western economy in Europe and even larger than the budget deficit in Greece? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm very surprised that Dean Lockhart, uh, Conservative spokesperson doesn't understand the Scottish budget. Yeah. The Scottish government balances its yeah. books every year and it's on the basis of that, the strength of our balance sheet, that we can deliver the Scottish growth scheme. Now I seriously hope that the Conservatives will be converts to our scheme to unlock half a billion pounds support to grow our economy and support businesses through this difficult and turbulent uh, time in terms of the economy. Question number two, Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution has had with Colleges Scotland and University Scotland regarding the forthcoming spending review. Cabinet Secretary. As Ministers with responsibility for engagement with both sectors, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science meet regularly with representatives of Scotland's colleges and universities to discuss a wide range of issues of interest to the sector, including resourcing issues. The Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science last met Colleges Scotland and representatives of University Scotland on the 31st of August. Ian Gray. Uh, the recent reports from Audit Scotland into funding of both uh, higher and further education show that both sectors uh, have seen cuts in their budgets year on year. In this spending review, will the Cabinet Secretary simply make the promise that their budgets will be protected? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think we've outlined in the manifesto on which we were elected what our commitments were to the sector, and that includes, very importantly, uh, free education in terms uh, of education and for colleges we're maintaining full-time equivalent college places. Uh, in terms of the report also referenced, it does say that the report highlights that Scotland's college sector is financially stable overall and that colleges continue to exceed their targets for student learning opportunities. But in answer to the question, uh, more specifically, of course, myself and ministers will engage closely with the SFC to consider the financial issues and take forward the opportunities for Scotland. And I can say uh, that over the last few months, I had one particularly enjoyable visit, and that was to City of Glasgow College uh, in Glasgow at the Riverside campus, a fantastic building and evidence of this government's commitment to capital in the sector, which I do think is transformational in terms of the education system in Scotland. Question number three, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution last met the Treasury and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. I spoke with the new Chancellor on the 21st of July to discuss areas of common interest, including the need to ensure active engagement between HM Treasury and the Scottish Government on the financial implications of work undertaken in response to the EU referendum outcome. Since then, I've written to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, welcoming the guarantees so far provided on EU funding, but making abundantly clear that the areas that have not been addressed must be revisited as a matter of urgency. I've offered to meet the Chancellor in London on the 21st of September to discuss matters of shared interest around the economy and public finances, the impact of the EU referendum and the need to continue to make progress in implementing the detail of the Scotland Act 2016. Jenny Mara. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Presiding officer, the Scottish taxpayer will pick up 60% of the cost of decommissioning the oil and gas industry through tax relief. As the Scottish people are funding these jobs, does the Cabinet Secretary think it is fair that we are paying for this work to be done in Norwegian yards rather than in ports like Dundee? I'm disappointed that given the huge opportunities for the economy here that the Cabinet Secretary did not discuss with the Treasury uh, any fiscal incentives for decommissioning when he met with them. Can he clarify for me if the Scottish Government has had any discussions with the Treasury over decommissioning tax relief and can he make it a priority to speak to the Treasury at the next opportunity on how they can work together to keep these tax, taxpayer funded jobs in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think the member raises a very fair question and a fair analysis of how we could take advantage of the decommissioning work that could be delivered to Scotland. The member's question was very specific. What conversations or what discussions had I had with HM Treasury and I've answered that accurately. However, my business and economy colleagues have had discussions uh, with UK ministers on this very subject. So the Scottish Government has been proactive in raising those opportunities. And through Scottish Enterprise, we are working on the decommissioning action plan to try and ensure that jobs and development comes to Scotland. And I will be 100% supportive uh, of that and absolutely raise specific interventions with the UK Government and add to my very long list of things that the UK Government could do to stimulate the UK and Scotland's economy. Question number four, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making in implementing the recommendations of the Commission on the Future Delivery of Public Services, chaired by Campbell Christie, calling for the prioritisation of preventative spend and an outcomes focus in delivering more effective and efficient public services. Cabinet Secretary. Our approach continues to be rooted in the four pillars of reform laid down by the Christie Agenda. We have made substantial progress across a broad range of public services, including in early years, justice and health and social care. Ivan McKee. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Cabinet Secretary should be aware that the Christie report estimates as much as 40% of all spending on public services accounted for by interventions that could have been avoided by prioritising a preventative approach. In order to realise these savings, the report recommends integration of service provision, the empowerment of individuals and communities receiving services, the removal of duplication and the sharing of services where possible. Can I ask what steps the Scottish Government is taking to make progress on these recommendations? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, this will clearly uh, feature as we move forward in the programme for government and our agenda and efforts on public service reform. But I think the government has made it clear in our approach on early years and education reform uh, and health as well. These are key parts of the preventative agenda and are certainly uh, part of the next phase of uh, reform. So truly transformational uh, opportunities that we can build upon uh, the successes of the last parliament around, for example, integration uh, joint boards and the Community Empowerment Act, which was partly about uh, people unlocking the potential in their own communities and being given the tools to do the job. So there's a great deal of work to be done around uh, public service reform, and that's why I'm delighted to be um, a member of the Cabinet Subcommittee on Public Service Reform. Uh, we'll look at this uh, very issue. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that change funds have been one of the principal means of prioritising preventative spending and encouraging innovation in public services. Does he therefore consider allocating um, something in the order of 1% of the Scottish budget to these change funds is adequate given the task ahead and will he reflect on that in the forthcoming budget? Well, I understand why uh, Jackie Bailey would be attracted to change funds. I think they were successful uh, in part, but what I would expect as Finance Secretary is that we use the totality of Scottish Government resources to transform our services, to rise to the challenge of the preventative approach in public service reform. So I'm not immediately minded to create a new plethora of change funds, uh, but expect public services and uh, government departments to focus on this, realising how important it is uh, to both uh, the government and clearly uh, the parliament. Question number five, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what Scotland's deficit is, both as a percentage of GDP and in cash terms, according to the latest year's figures. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well Mr Bibby will have heard me say uh, to the Conservatives that, of course, uh, the Scottish Government balances its books. JERS shows that North Sea revenues fell in 2015-16 as a result of challenging conditions faced by the oil and gas operations. However, this decline was more than offset by Scottish onshore revenue, which grew by £1.9 billion. Including a geographical share of the North Sea, Scotland's net fiscal deficit, according to JERS estimates in 15-16, was 9.5% of GDP, or £14.8 billion. Neil Bibby. The First Minister spoke yesterday of a real battle of ideas, a sense of solidarity versus the ideology of the small state, yet the JERS study confirmed that with one of the biggest deficits in Europe, the size of the state in an independent Scotland would be a great deal smaller. Would the Finance Secretary therefore acknowledge the vital importance of UK fiscal transfers to Scotland and can he confirm that according to JERS, those transfers currently amount to £9 billion, money for jobs, services and communities right here in Scotland? Secretary. No, there's no such transfer. See, Neil Bibby's got it wrong. Again, these are estimates of expenditure. It is not the balance sheet of an independent Scotland, and the unionist parties don't seem to get that. UK economic policy has failed, but there were positives in the JERS report as well, such as onshore revenues growth, improvements on GDP growth, record at rising employment and improved productivity. And as I've said before, Scotland generally it generates more revenues per head than the rest of the United Kingdom. And in terms of output per head, it's higher than anywhere else in the United Kingdom, with the exception of London and the South East. But ask yourselves this, why is it that a nation blessed with such assets and wealth cannot be allowed to share that prosperity, unlike Norway? a very comparable nation to Scotland, who's not in deficit, but in surplus, yeah. in surplus, a small independent nation. What is the difference? So we have a choice. What do we do as a government and as a parliament? Invest in the economy, secure Scotland's political position in terms of EU membership, grow our economy and support businesses to help deliver that growth. And that's exactly what this government is doing. Yeah. Question. Question number six, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its spending plans for 2016-17 will have on Glasgow and Renfrewshire. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government will continue to support the Glasgow and Renfrewshire area through a wide range of programmes. The 2016 Local Government Settlement Funding Package was firmly focused on the delivery of joint priorities to deliver sustainable economic growth, protect frontline services and support the most vulnerable within our communities. 
These shared priorities will improve outcomes for local people. We're also investing in local infrastructure. For example, three schools are currently in construction in the area as part of the National Schools for the Future programme and are due to open next year. There's also further investment to motorways, subways, hospitals and health centres. Yesterday, the First Minister said her government's priority was jobs and economic growth. The Cabinet Secretary's predecessor, John Swinney, scrapped the Glasgow Air Rail Link project. Uh, the leader of Renfrewshire Council, the leader of Glasgow City Council and local businesses have now pressed the Scottish Government to get on and implement that project that would create 15,000 construction jobs and 30,000 permanent jobs. The First Minister, the Transport Minister and the Finance Secretary all represent Glasgow and Renfrewshire. Why won't they stand up and deliver for those cities and those communities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, I've got news for uh, Anna Sarwar, and it's this. We have signed, we have signed. I was a signatory to the city deal proposal. And following that, that discussion about releasing over a billion pounds for that partnership, it was then left to the local authorities to take forward their proposals. Yes, there's checks and balances in place, and you would expect that to be the case. And I'm just coming to that, which might surprise you that I have written, I have written when I was Transport Minister on the 3rd of February 2015 to the Leader of the Council to outline our support for the City Deal package and specifically in relation to Garrow, I said this, we stand ready to work with you to deliver improved surface access to Glasgow Airport within the overall City Deal. But I want to make it very clear that the Scottish Government will not be responsible for any additional costs resulting from decisions taken by or investments made by the Clyde Valley partners. So with a billion pounds to get on with these projects, I turn to the Labour Party and say, what's stopping you to get on with the project? If you want to deliver, Garrel, do it. We've given you the resources. And I would hate to think, I would hate to think that the Labour Party was simply indulging in an artificial game of grievance before the council elections, knowing fine well, knowing fine well, knowing fine well, having been given the resources with the checks and balance in place, the only people stopping Garrel is the Labour Party in the west of Scotland. Jimmy Green. Uh, to uh, further ask the Scottish Government what effect the spiralling cost of the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme will have on its plans for Glasgow and Renfrewshire, and if the Government could today update the Parliament on the total cost of this project and if they expect it to rise further. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think that helps uh, make the point that the Conservatives might want to understand. Network Rail is not directly responsible or accountable to the Scottish Government in the way that we would like. If we had devolution of network rail to the Scottish Government, maybe they would be able to deliver projects in the way that the Scottish Government delivers major infrastructure uh, projects. It is the case, it is the case that uh, this uh, proposal for the rail link will make a transformative difference to the rail service in that part of the country. And we would expect it to be delivered to our specifications. But I'm afraid the issues with network rail simply suggest that we should have greater control over that operation rather than leave it to the UK government who have failed to contain the, to contain the cost of that organisation. Question number seven, Graham Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking in light of the recent GARS figures to ensure that Scotland's deficit does not increase further. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is focused on actions to support Scotland's economic resilience and growth. In keeping with the priorities set out in our economic strategy, we're taking action to facilitate investment, improve innovation, support inclusive growth and encourage Scottish businesses to internationalise. But the biggest risk to Scotland's economic prosperity is being taken out of the EU. We're taking action to support Scotland's economic resilience, which is why we announced the £100 million capital acceleration programme to provide immediate support to the economy. We'll continue to explore all possible means to protect Scotland's place in Europe in line with the way people voted here, which is vital for jobs, investment and long-term prosperity. Graeme Simpson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The GRS figures show that Scotland's public spending deficit stood at just under 15 billion in the 
past financial year. That's 9.5% uh, share of GDP, more than double the 4% figure for the UK as a whole. If anything, shows that independence should be off the table for a generation. That report was it. <laughs> Yet yesterday, the SNP left the threat of another referendum hanging over the country that has already rejected it with all the uncertainty that brings. The government's answer to set up a growth Question commission. The best thing the minister could do would be to take the uh, independence referendum off the table. Will he do that? If not, why not? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> again. Presiding officer, here we go again. The Conservatives obsessed with the Constitution. <laughs> obsessed with the Constitution. And what's worse? And what's worse? And what's worse? We're back to the Scotland's too wee and too poor to be an independent nation. We're back to that tired old argument. The reality is that JERS isn't a verdict on independence. It's an indictment on Westminster control of this country's economy. But let me turn with the limited time left, the uh, presiding officer, to what we can do about growing our there is no economy. Time left, Let's see if the Conservatives will support these actions. Of course, primarily, we could try and secure Scotland's place in the single market. And at the Prime Minister's questions today, the Prime Minister couldn't even say whether she supported in or out. We are investing in infrastructure, maximising exports, backing innovation, embarking on house building, accelerating planning, increasing small business bonus, boosting education and childcare, releasing our renewables Cabinet potential, Secretary, investing capital point, stimulus please. and of course half a billion pounds in the Scottish growth scheme. That's what we are doing to support Scotland's economy. Thank you. Move to economy, jobs and fair work. Question number one, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to support the Murray economy? Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, we are committed to supporting sustainable economic growth across Murray. We are investing substantial amounts in road and education infrastructure and are ensuring businesses continue to benefit from support from our enterprise agencies. This helps to create jobs and to stimulate growth in the area. Richard Lockhead. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that a threat hangs over the Murray economy as a result of the MOD's estates review that has led to questions over the future of the Kinloss Barracks. Indeed, yesterday's meeting of the Murray Economic Partnership heard that over 1,000 full-time equivalent jobs in Murray are dependent on the barracks. So does he agree that any threat to Kinloss Barracks amounts to a breach of faith by the UK Government, especially after the closure of RAF Kinloss? Will he now demand and support the community from the UK Government that there is a full consultation prior to any decision being taken over the barracks future? And that consultation, of course, was originally promised, but then they changed their mind. And we also call from the, the UK Government to deliver the utmost transparency as to what options are on the table at the moment and to share those with the local community. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Richard Lockhead is right to describe this as not just a threat, but a huge threat to the local economy of Murray. Uh, for my part, I've spoken with Mark Lancaster some weeks ago, who is the minister responsible in the UK government, and made the request of him that in relation to this defence review, this defence estate review, when it impacts on Scotland, for example, in relation to the Murray local economy, or in relation to Fort George, a shared premises of the Scottish Government, or even the Edinburgh Castle and other premises, there should be discussion between the two governments, and that has not taken place. In fact, that's been refused by the UK Government, who have nevertheless had discussions with uh, local partners in Murray, but not with the Scottish Government. In addition to that, the First Minister has written to the Secretary of State for Defence, asking that he meets with me immediately to discuss these issues. In the case of Murray, 830 jobs at least at risk. So I will continue to take those steps and support the work of uh, Richard Lockhead and others in taking the steps that they're taking. What I will not do is support the statement which I've heard was said uh, on social media by a Conservative MSP who said, the battle's over, the base has been saved, lay down your arms. The one step we'll not take in relation to Murray's uh, future is a step back and we'll continue to support Richard Lockhead and those that wish to support him in defending these jobs. Douglas Ross. 
Uh, thank you. I uh, will focus my question on actual events rather than speculation, which has been generated by the SNP. Uh, and there is no concerns uh, that are, are more serious than the threat over the Kinloss base. But that speculation has come from a tweet by the local SNP MP and nothing further. But the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his first response about the roads policy and the roads budget. Can he confirm to the Chamber today that the Scottish Government fully supports the campaign by the Murray Economic Partnership and its Chair, Councillor John Cow, to have the A95 improved? And given the importance of this route to the vibrant whisky industry and the local economy, does he agree with me that opportunities for widening the carriageways should be considered as Transport Scotland develops its maintenance programme? Cabinet Secretary. In relation to roads and Murray, I think what we have done is what no previous government, Conservative or otherwise, have done, which is to commit to the £3 billion upgrading of the A96, the main arterial route uh, from Inverness to Aberdeen, which is hugely important for that area. We have also provided uh, substantial support to the local economy, to the local council, in order to uh, support their roads building infrastructure. But he, the member says, let's talk about actual events. If it's the case that he has not tweeted, but the battle has been won, and in fact that the Murray defence, I'm talking about Murray defence uh, work, jobs here. If he's saying that the battle has been won, if that's not an actual event and he's not said that, perhaps he could tell the chamber. If he has said that, how does he think that representing the interests of Westminster and his colleagues down there is better than representing the interests of the people of Murray? Question. Yes, point of order, Mr Ross. On a point of order, if Mr Brown would like to check my social media history, I'm sure he'll come back to the chamber to correct the statement that he's now made twice. Thank you, Mr. Ross. I don't believe that's a point of order, but you've made a point. Question number two, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage employers to pay the living wage and provide secure employment. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the member will be aware that the majority of powers over employment remain with the UK Parliament. However, with the powers that we have available, we have developed a distinctive approach to fair work, which, amongst other objectives, will help promote secure employment. Building on the publication of the Fair Work Framework, a recently published labour market strategy sets out an approach where fair work is central to improving the lives of individuals and their families. And that strategy includes a range of actions, including the work the Scottish Government continues to undertake with the Poverty Alliance to increase the number of living wage accredited employers in Scotland, which now stands at over 585. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and I wondered, would the Cabinet Secretary agree to work with me on these issues, specifically with regard to the Edinburgh Festival, for example, by working with relevant parties to encourage more large venues to pay the living wage and to provide more secure employment? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I certainly would uh, commit to doing that and would also acknowledge the huge economic impact that the Edinburgh Festival has. Uh, and again, a very successful year for the festival and associated other festivals and the Fringe. Uh, and certainly my officials and I are always happy to meet with employers who are paying the living wage and especially those larger employers through whom living wage accreditation would benefit a greater number of employees. I would suggest that the member could usefully also get in touch with the Scottish Living Wage Accreditation Initiative through the Poverty Alliance, who the Scottish Government is supporting to promote the living wage and they'll be able to bring their invaluable experience of working with a wide range of employers to these discussions. Richard Leonard. Yep. In, in light of that last answer, does the Cabinet Secretary consider that when there are over 360,000 private sector employee, employers in Scotland that a target of just 1,000 accredited living wage employers by this time next year is ambitious enough? Cabinet Secretary. I would never uh, suggest that we are limited to that number, but I think it's right that we do have to start, and we've made a start where the UK government has not done this, and many other governments have not done this. And uh, I don't know whether what Richard Leonard is uh, describing as a council of despair, don't bother trying in the first place. We are trying, I think we're having major success, and together we're lifting the number of people in Scotland paid, which is already one of the highest in the UK, I think it perhaps be the, the second highest in the UK, happy to check that. So we're having success in relation to this, and of course it's not just the companies which sign up to the living wage but it's the impact they have on other people as well the influence that they have so we'll continue with that activity and I would hope that we'd have the support of Richard Leonard and his colleagues in that activity Patrick Harvey thank you I welcome the measures that have been taken to promote the living wage given yesterday's announcement that the Scottish Government intends to provide a program of loans and guarantees to businesses can we have a guarantee that that facility will only be available to businesses which do pay the real living wage 
Cabinet Secretary. I think all businesses in the, or the vast majority of businesses in the, in the Scottish economy are well aware of the Scottish Government's approach both to the living wage and to inclusive growth. And those companies which we do engage with through, as Patrick Harvey mentions, the Scottish Growth Scheme, which could be a substantial benefit to companies and employment in Scotland, will also be well aware of our, um, our preference and our drive to try and drive up the number of those employees in Scotland to receive the living wage, not just because it's right that they should do so, but also because it helps the economy in general. There's more disposable income with those that have to spend all their income to survive if they're paid the living wage. Neil Findlay. Um, one of the ways in which uh, people uh, we can advance the living wage is becoming living wage employers ourselves, and I commend the Cabinet Secretary uh, for doing so. But maybe the Cabinet Secretary could assist Mr McPherson, who asked the question, and encourage him to become a living wage employer himself. Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure uh, Neil Finlay can be encouraging in that regard as well. I think it's down to all of us who want to see uh, uh, the number of people employed in the living wage um, to encourage others. Now, it may well be, I don't know the individual circumstances, maybe all the employees uh, of MSPs are paid the living wage, but not all are accredited to it. That's perfectly possible. But, of course, like Neil Finlay, I would want to encourage as many people as possible to pay the living wage and also to go further and to get accredited for having uh, done so. I'm not going to let Mr McPherson back in, although he does want to speak again. Question number three, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Fair Work Framework fits into the recently published Labour Market Strategy. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government shares the vision set out by the Fair Work Convention in their framework through the Labour Market Strategy. We've been clear in our endorsement of the framework and we have set out that our commitment to continue to work with the Convention to build on the principles they have established. Fair Work is central to our ambitions. We believe that a strong labour market is built in fairness will drive inclusive, sustainable economic growth. To achieve that, it is essential we continue to support the Convention in promoting the framework and engaging employers in discussions on how we can work together to champion fairer, better workplaces. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for his response. I'm sure the Minister is aware that Scotland now has the worst gender pay gap in the UK, and given that the Fair Work Convention was set up in part to tackle issues such as this, what will the Scottish Government do to ensure that employers close the gap, implement the framework and end what is effectively being called a penalty on motherhood here in Scotland? Mr Hepburn. Well, I, I think that's a very reasonable uh, question uh, to uh, ask. I think the first thing I would reflect upon is that we have seen improvements in the gender pay gap uh, here in Scotland. I would uh, readily uh, concede that has not gone far enough. The first thing, of course, we're doing through the labour market strategy is we're committing half a million pounds to support the Convention in taking forward its work I recognise there's more we can do another of the commitments in the labour market strategies to take forward a, a women returners uh, project which I think can also help in that regard but I certainly think it's uh, incumbent on us all to work uh, as an administration through our agencies and with employers to uh, reach out and make sure we're doing better in that regard. Question number four, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish guidance on the implementation of the apprenticeship levy. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Since the announcement of the apprenticeship levy by the UK government, this government has been working with employers to develop a response that will support skills development and drive economic growth. Over the summer, we consulted with employers and other interested parties to consider the impact of the levy and to explore opportunities for continuing to expand and enhance our successful modern apprenticeship programme in Scotland. The consultation closed on 26 August and we bring forward uh, plans uh, as soon as possible from the, that consultation. Louis MacDonald. Well, I'm sure if the Minister has read responses such as those from the oil and gas skills body of PITO or from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, he will know uh, that they believe that that apprenticeship levy should be fully committed to training and skills, and they are very uh, urgently looking for some assurance to that effect. Does he accept that many employers are already planning their training programmes for the next financial year, have started to do that, and cannot do that efficiently and effectively until they know what money is coming back into their business from the training uh, apprenticeship level? Well, I, I certainly accept that this has been an issue uh, for uh, business, for uh, employers. I would hope Mr Macdonald would recognise the implementation of the levy has not been in our hands. It's been a levy that's been taken forward uh, by the UK government. I, uh, of course, we still uh, seek uh, clarity on the funding uh, that we will uh, secure as a result of this levy. That has not been uh, forthcoming yet from the UK government. We have, of course, engaged in the, uh, the consultation uh, process. My clear commitment is uh, now to move forward as swiftly as, as possible because he does make the, the fair point, I think, that employers uh, are trying to take forward plans and they're looking for that uh, degree of reassurance. So my clear commitment is to uh, work on the basis of the consultation we've undertaken and implement its findings as quickly as possible. 
Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, agree with Lewis MacDonald's point and ask the Minister to reflect on the evidence that was given to the Education Committee this morning, which Standard Life, amongst others, made clear that they would see the principle here that the, the apprentice levy monies do come back to Scotland, but go back into schools and training. Does he agree with that principle, and will he make sure that happens? Minister. Well, I, I would reiterate the point uh, that I have made. Certainly, I've been uh, spending my summer engaging with uh, a range of organisations including uh, private sector employers, uh, uh, the local government and others around uh, how we respond to the introduction of this levy by uh, the UK uh, government. I would reiterate the point we have not got final clarity on the funding we will receive. We have undertaken a consultation and it is incumbent on me to drive forward uh, the analysis of that consultation and putting in place a framework arising thereof. Question number five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it and its agencies are taking to promote Eurocentral and Newhouse as a place for business and innovation. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we are committed to promoting Scotland as an attractive place for business and innovation. Uh, for example, our £500 million investment in the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvement project will bring safer roads, less congestion and a better quality of life for road users. These improvements will help promote sustainable economic growth by improving access to facilities and employment areas such as at Eurocentral, at Newhouse, for communities and businesses in central Scotland and beyond. Richard Lyle. I can thank the, camp, the uh, Minister for that answer. I note with interest that Eurocentral site is nearly 80 per cent uh, of capacity for occupation by business. Can I therefore ask what further action the Scottish Government can undertake to ensure continued econo economic growth in this area of my constituency? Minister. Uh, well, we certainly welcome the news of that success and want to support that continued sustainable economic growth in, in the area. Businesses in the area continue to benefit from the uh, support of Scottish Enterprise and from regional selective assistance grants worth £1 million this financial year. Uh, but through our Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, we are investing in enterprise workspaces at Newhouse. And in addi addition, on the 1st of April of this year, we designated BioCity as the sixth site as part of the Life Sciences Enterprise area. Uh, we do believe this uh, could see employment boosted by another 180 new jobs by 2020 as the location develops uh, further as a more significant centre for life sciences. Question number six, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on implementing the recommendations in uh, the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce final report. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. In taking forward the development of the Young Workforce agenda, we are growing vocational provision for young people in the senior phase of their education, including a significant expansion of modern foundation apprenticeships. In addition, we have established 16 uh, regional DEYW employer groups across the country, uh, created new national standards for work placements and careers education, invested in the early introduction of careers advice seen over 300 uh, businesses take up the new investors and young people accolade and refocused activity across our youth employment apprenticeship programmes on young people who need the most support. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I agree with the uh, Minister's drive on this matter, but he will be aware that the budget for 2016, 15-16 uh, and for subsequent years uh, has now been, as they describe, mainstreamed uh, into uh, other budgets. In other words, there's no specific budget for this area, which it had in the first couple of years. Given that he's got uh, clear targets in the remaining years of this programme to expand activity, how is he hoping to meet uh, those targets, which are certainly demanding? And is he also aware of the recent City and Guild Skills Report that shows that some young people in Scotland are not aware of available career paths and would he agree that that's exactly the kind of issue that Sir Ian Wood's report raised and needs to address? Minister. Certainly on the latter point I would uh, agree uh, absolutely. I think what we're trying to achieve uh, in driving forward this entire agenda is a culture shift within the education sector that allows for greater uh, engagement in an appropriate fashion for uh, industry to be involved in uh, opening up the horizons for young people. I certainly uh, think that uh, from the evidence I have seen, uh, that work uh, is ongoing, but is beginning uh, to bear uh, fruit. And that's why it is important that we mainstream it and make it uh, a core uh, part of the uh, purpose of our uh, school environment. And that uh, work uh, continues and I think uh, will continue to bear fruit going forward. Question number seven, Marie Todd. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support the establishment of Orkney as a centre for excellence or a living laboratory in relation to energy storage and transformation. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Um, the Scottish Government welcomes and supports the wide range of activity underway to harness Orkney's renewable energy resources. 
and to help overcome some of the impact of grid constraints in advance of seeing a, a vital investment in connecting the islands to the grid. A great example of our support is the Surf and Turf project, which is being assisted by £1.175 million in funding under our Local Energy Challenge Fund. The project will produce hydrogen from both onshore wind and marine energy from generation in the island of Ide, which will then be used, uh, can be stored, transported and converted back into electricity for use in buildings and berth uh, ferries at Kirkwall Harbour. As with many other projects we're supporting in Orkney, Surf and Turf involves working with a range of partners and a significant level of local expertise. In this case, that includes the European Marine Energy Centre, or EMEC, and Community Energy Scotland. And the project has been the catalyst for further investment of €5 million Euros in Orkney by the European Commission in support of the Big Hit Hydrogen Project. In February 2014, the Scottish Government uh, provided a £3 million grant to EMEC to address the problem of grid constraints at its tidal site, and this investment enabled EMEC to carry out initial scoping work and then purchase an electrolyzer to convert power generated at the tidal site to hydrogen fuel. Hey, Todd. Scotland. Scotland's wave in tidal energy resources is almost unparalleled. It represents a quarter of Europe's tidal stream and 10% of its wave energy potential. A large part of Scotland's wave and tidal energy is available in the northern and western isles and along the west coast. These are areas which offer considerable challenges when it comes to feeding this energy back into the main grid. Programmes such as Local Energy Scotland allow communities which produce large amounts of renewable energy to use that energy locally. What progress has been made by the Scottish Government to help communities make the most of their renewable energy capabilities? Slightly briefer, Mr Minister. <laughs> I'll try and be brief, Presiding Officer. Um, certainly, we, we are very pleased with progress on community energy uh, uh, rollout. We have achieved 508 megawatts of community and locally owned renewable energy capacity by 2015, which achieved our target five years early, and we're delighted with that. But the, the member, uh, Marie Todd, is, is absolutely right to highlight some of the key constraints, including the grid. Uh, it was, I was pleased to, to meet with her and renewables uh, operators in Orkney last week, and we heard clearly that the importance of the investment in connecting the islands to the mainland uh, to allow local projects such as those delivered by communities in Orkney to access uh, the market and obviously uh, maximise the economic opportunity for the islands. Thank you. And the next item of business.